What's up, guys? We are live. We got Ross Jeffries joining us for a special podcast, and I am quite excited for this one. So, Ross, I'm sure most people are familiar with you, but for the 5% who are not, can you give a little bit of an introduction? Yes. Well, I am the original gangster, the OG, the guru of Gash, the Prince of Poon, the man who started the whole seduction community way back, get ready for it, you young men, 1988. 1988. Well, the first guy to have sex. No, that's not true. <laughs> but I was the first person to codify how to get laid. This is my original book that I wrote in 1988. You can see the difference in how I looked then and how I look now. <laughs> There's quite a difference. Ah, still the same thing then. Still looks exactly uh, the same. A little cosmetics, a little Photoshop. You could let me. You, I'm sure you could get me looking good for an online profile. I don't know. Thank you, sir. <laughs> so yeah, I started all the way back in 1988, and my insight was that I really couldn't do a lot back then to change my looks. I was six foot two, 130 pounds. So I looked like a skeleton, uh -huh. big, thick glasses and I had very low self esteem and had a lot of body shame. And I was the nice guy, the big brother, worst thing of all the girlfriend with a penis. You know what that phenomena is where women complain to you about the guy they're banging, but they tell you, you're such a nice guy. I always say to my female friends, I do have female friends. I say, don't call a guy a nice guy. It's like me saying you look fat in those shorts. It's the worst thing you can say. It's like saying you don't see that that human being in front you're of you. You're not really a man. Yeah. You're not a man. You're a girlfriend with a penis. Yeah. And it's a really terrible thing because you think about it, saying someone's a nice guy. You're not only saying that you won't have sex with them. You're saying it's not even okay for him to think about having sex. Mm -hmm. With you so it's a terrible thing so i started out in 1988 and my insight was that i i came upon nlp neurolinguistic programming now there's a lot of controversy about nlp is it scientific is it not scientific does it really work in my experience nlp is about using language to address the subconscious mind and evoke a person's desires imagination the fantasy mechanisms of women and so what i teach fundamentally is this Alex if what you're doing works if you every guy has to take care of themselves you got to take care of your health you've got to take care of your emotional stability if you can build a social circle but not every guy can I have clients who live in bumfuck Idaho there is no social circle so I'm saying those things are all great don't stop doing it but if you are not using the power of subconscious communication to influence and evoke and create women's emotions, their deep fantasy mechanisms, then you're leaving a lot of puss on the table. And I don't like to leave money, pussy, anything on the table. So really that kind of power is extraordinary. My students get results that would appear to be magic, but in reality, it's emotional engineering. My crazy claim is you can use language to engineer a woman's emotions. That's really what speed seduction is about. And the other half is healing your own inner game. Because if I give you all these techniques, but your own inner game sucks, it's like you're going to hold the techniques in front of you as an apology, as like a sword, as a shield. So women. Yeah, no, no, this is all very interesting. Let's uh, let's unpack this a little bit, uh, you know, for the people who are not familiar. And actually, I would consider myself in that category as well. So you mentioned there's two components, basically, right? There's the inner and the outer. And you're, so give you, can you like kind of expand on this and give some examples? Yeah. Let's talk about using language to communicate with women. I was explaining what I do with a woman the other day. It's the best topic I can talk about because they are eager to hear what I say. But let's give a simple example. There are three big mistakes most men make in their communication with women. I'll tell you what those are. Number one, talking about themselves. Uh -uh, not a good idea. Number two, having data-driven conversations. Here's what I mean by that, Alex. A lot of my students are engineers, IT people, and they tend to talk in facts, figures, data. Oh, agreed. They'll say, oh, you know, I went to Hawaii on vacation. I flew Alaska Airlines. I stayed on the, at the Baziki Wiki Hotel. No, 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 no. It's a narrative. It doesn't no. engage the imagination. Or they interrogate the woman. Instead of no. having a dialogue, it's like, really, where'd you go to school? Why did you do that? Blah, blah, no. blah, blah, blah. No. Uh -huh. But there's a way of talking to women that evokes their imagination. So I'll give you a simple example. What's the difference between saying to a woman, saying to a woman, what do you like to do for fun? 
which I think is a chump question. Everyone asks that question. Mm -hmm. And this question, when you want to do something that's just for you, something where you really indulge yourself that makes you think, damn, life is good. What do you crave doing? What do you really love to do? That's a much different kind of question. Because mm -hmm. to answer that question, she can't answer it from her fact-driven mind. She has to dive down, go down into her imagination where she thinks about indulging herself, fantasy, escape. Now, I, did I directly say, hey, Debbie, think about sex? No. But by the way I asked the question, she's going to start thinking about fantasies, and fantasies are right next door to where she fantasizes by sex, about sex. So this is one example of the kind of communication that's going to get a woman excited, turned on. Is that going to be enough to get her to drop her pants? No, but it's the start. So what's the uh, process for engineering these questions? Like, how, what's, the, what's the logic? Like, how did you come up with that? I understood. I studied Ericksonian hypnosis. And when Milton Erickson was a hypnotist who I think was the hypnosis, what Einstein was the physics. He took it out of the realm of you are going to sleep, look at the watch. He made it all conversational. Mm -hmm. And he would ask questions that would evoke trances. Instead of saying, uh, well, you are getting sleepy right now, he would say, now I'm wondering as you allow yourself to relax, which one of those chairs will be the one that will permit yourself to go into a trance deeply? He would ask questions that had suggestions embedded in them. But here's my recognition. Uh -huh. And let me back up, Alex, and say to everyone who's watching this, whether you're watching it live or on the replay, I want to make this very clear. Nothing I'm saying is scientific. That doesn't mean it's not true. It just means there's no laboratory data behind it. Uh -huh. It's not true with a capital T. It's only my model. It's my map of how things work. It's subject to change. It's incomplete. I'm sure it's got some mistakes in it. I want to make that very clear. I respect you a lot for saying that, man, because a lot of people would not say that. So much It's thoughts. true. No, it's true. It's very much an open-ended architecture. I've learned from my students. I encourage my best students to come on stage or to create their own products and, and yeah. teach in my group. I, I strongly I mean, encourage, thing. Yeah. I encourage that. I think good work stands up to rigorous critique and, and skepticism. Mm -hmm. So be that, be that as it may, here's, this is just my map of how women work. It's only a map. It's not true. I say there are four levels to a woman's mind. The first level is the checklist. Got to get it done. Got to get my car walked. I think we froze for a second. Ross, are you still there? He's going to froze on his end, I think. Yo, guys, give me a check mark if you can still see this. Because for me, the screen just completely froze. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's frozen on his end. Let me text him. Yo, my apologies, guys. It froze on his end, so let me just uh, message him. Oh, we lost him completely. Froze. And damn, it was getting spicy too. Uh, all right, just bear with Ross for a minute. Oh, I'm sure he's gonna pop back on. All right, so who wants to hear my number one secret for uh, number one text for getting any girl to come straight to your place without any objections and coming straight over and just letting you have your way with her? That magical text that I've never, ever revealed, ever, that I've kept only to myself that has just worked so well for me time and time again. Are you guys ready to hear it? What are you using? We're using StreamYard. <laughs> if you guys can't tell, I'm fucking with you. Uh, there is no text, unfortunately. Let's just give uh, Ross another minute. I wish there was. My life would be so much easier. Right, he said, hold on. Yeah, I love it when like, you see the marketing spiel on like, I don't know, like the sales page. Like the number one secret that if you do this, you're good. 
And it's like, oh shit, what is this number one thing? And it's just like a bunch of bullshit. Asking about the 1992 show. Okay. Yeah. I don't even know what that's referring to. I just mainly know about Ross from uh, the game, which is one of the first books he's read. And then he did an interview with John Anthony, which I uh, skimmed through a while back. Uh, there we go. That. All right. We got you, man. It's all yeah, good. Yeah. My internet. I, I'm doing this through the phone. The internet. Anyway. So I say yeah. there are four levels to yeah. a woman's mind. There's the get it done level, the checklist. I got to get my laundry done. Got to go to the bank, et cetera, et cetera. There's the social approval level. What would my friends think? Uh, should I dress? Should I be a real slutty? No. Should I be a good girl? All the conflicting messages that media gives her. You follow? Uh -huh. There's her autopilot level, which she's used to being attracted to. Well, I only like bad boys. I like guys who are tall. I like rich guys, et cetera, et cetera. But then there's the fourth level of the mind. That's the deep subconscious level where she fantasizes, where she's open to suggestion, where she dreams at night. And what I'm saying is speed seduction skips through those first three levels because we don't want to be on a woman's checklist. It's too much of a gamble. What if you don't fit her checklist? What if you just aren't a rich guy? What if you don't have muscles, et cetera, et cetera? It dives deep into her fantasy mechanisms and the part of her brain that's much more suggestible. And so any communication we have in speed seduction is pretty much designed to reach that fourth level of the mind. Oh, whether, it's, whether it's an initial, can I show you how we use it on a walk up, on an approach? Yeah, of course. I'd love to hear that. So, so a typical approach would be something, Not I don't teach this, but an approach might be, uh, I need to get your opinion. Who lies more, men or women? Oh. That's the stupid RSD approach. No, that was a really fucking dumb approach. I agree with that. Fucking dumb approach. Or, hey, I saw you here. You're really pretty. I wanted to say hi. That's that one's a, a lot better than the, uh, the first one, but yeah. It's a lot better. The problem is women have heard it before. So what I like to do is to say some, either say something funny and then own it and then give her an implied compliment. So here's an example. I did this with a woman the other day. She's maybe about 35, I'm 62, about to be 63. She had a big smile on her face. I said, excuse me, do you work for the Department of Defense? And she said, no, why? I said, because your smile is a weapon of mass distraction. And she broke out laughing. And then I said, now that wasn't enough. By itself, that's a nice laugh, but then you're the party entertainment and you're gone, gone, right? So I owned that cheesy line. I said, okay, I know that was really cheesy, but I saw you and I thought she probably gets approached 10 times a week, come up with something different and see if she has a sense of humor we could really enjoy. My name's Ross. Now, what did I do there? I owned the cheese. I admitted that it was cheesy, so I paced her. I paced the fact that that's what she was thinking. But when I saw you here, I thought to myself, she probably gets approached 10 times a week. Now, Alex, did I say you're so beautiful you get approached 10 times a week? No. No, I implied it. So that's what I call an implied compliment. So no. already, already I'm getting her mind to begin to fill in the blanks. I'm activating the part of her mind that imagines. If I had said you're so pretty, you get stopped 10 times a week. Yeah, that's, that's, that's actually a very good point because I, I do a lot of that too, like the implied compliments, but I never really even thought about it. Like, for example, saying instead of saying you're a pretty girl, as a pretty girl, I'm sure you know, versus you're such a pretty girl, right? It's the same message, but the way you say it makes a huge difference. So, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. so I want, her, I want her to fill in the blanks with her own imagination. Do you get it? And then I did something else. I said, come up with something different and see if she has the sense of humor. There I'm screening. I'm implying, but I'm not saying, okay, you're pretty. We got it off the table. What else do you got? If I said it directly, if I said, all right, you're pretty, but I need more than that. What else do you bring to the table? She'd tell me to fuck myself and she'd leave. Yeah. And then I add in a suggestion. See if she has the sense of humor. We could really enjoy each other. So I'm priming her subconscious mind from the very beginning to fill in the blanks for itself. Does that make does that 
connect in with you. No, that right makes perfect sense to me because it's basically kind of what I do already. With that. I've just never like really thought about it as deeply as you're explaining it, but that makes perfect sense to me. So with speed seduction, we have a principle and a concept for everything we do. It's not just memorization. I explain what it's designed to do. Think of a stage magician, someone like Penn and Teller or what, whoever they are. Each point of the trick is set up to advance the next part of the trick. Now, I'm not saying we're tricking women because we're not. We're communicating with them in a way that gets them excited and turned on. I'm using the metaphor of a magic trick. When the magician makes this move where he moves the coin and drops it, he's dropping it, not because he actually dropped it. He's dropping it so he can grab something else. You get, so everything we're doing, in this case, we're beginning the process of opening up her subconscious or unconscious mind. I use them interchangeably. They mean the same thing. We're opening up that part of her mind that is suggestible right from the very beginning. So that's an example of how we would use it in a in a walk up in an approach. So what Just, happened after that? Like, what, what was your what did you do? After we got into a, we got into a conversation, and I said, "So I'm really curious about something. This is a pattern we call hard on sleeve." Oh. I said, "You seem like someone who really knows who she is," I, which is again setting a high bar. What is she going to say? No, I don't know who I am. So I'm setting her up to be responsive to the next thing I say. Mm -hmm. You seem like someone who really knows who she is. I, I got to ask, are you someone who wears her heart on her sleeve or can you hide her feelings? Now, let me stop right there. That's a very interesting topic for women because it revolves around feelings and hiding their feelings. Every woman has had the experience, Alex, of trying to suppress strong feelings of desire for a man because they don't want to feel like a slut. You get it? So I'm immediately tapping into that topic without telling her I am. Do you wear your heart on your sleeve or can you hide your feelings? For example, let's say you meet, you meet a guy and you begin to tune in to that sense of excitement, those butterflies that let you know something really big is about to go down, Debbie. <laughs> can you hide that that's what's taking place? Or could your friends notice that's happening right now? You hear, I'm leaning on it. Normally, this sounds creepy the way I'm saying it because I'm leaning on it. So you guys. No, I, I understand exactly what you're doing. Your tonality is on point. When I'm doing these podcasts, I talk pretty fast. And when I'm talking to women, it's much more slow and deliberate. So I, I know I'm exactly what they're doing. I'm marking out the suggestions for her so that her unconscious mind can hear it. So I'm giving suggestions to, for example, when you feel that flow of feelings, that's the command to feel that flow of feelings, that excitement, when you feel those butterflies, I'm telling you to feel excited, to feel butterflies that lets you know something big is about to go down. What does that mean? When I say something big is about to go down, in my mind, I imagine, I got a my, big dick. <laughs> I imagine my cock down, going down her throat. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Now, you guys may be having the response at first. Well, that sounds ridiculous. So what if you're imagining it? Well, here's the thing. If you, people have a very weak frame on their reality, once you get inside their frame, you'd be surprised if you imagine something and you're putting it through a sense of strong willpower and you're using the right suggestions, you'd be surprised. And I think it may be just the inflection in your tonality, how often they'll begin to imagine what you're imagining. Or maybe it's coincidence. I just know it knows. No, no, no I, th I, think, I think you're definitely right. Uh, did you wind up getting the tricks number? Who get who? <laughs> Members are wood. We wound up making out. Okay. We wound up going going to her car and making out, and then I got her number. Numbers are. See, here's the thing. In speed seduction, we don't think of behaviors. We don't think how do I get her phone number? How do I get a blowjob? Instead, we think what states of consciousness, what flows of feeling in her body, what visual. So she'll initiate all those behaviors. So she'll give us those behaviors. So speed seduction is also a different way of thinking about connecting with women. We don't think in terms of behaviors, blowjobs, sex. We think what state of mind do we want them in where they'll just naturally want to give us those behaviors automatically. This is, again, lifted from Ericksonian hypnosis. Erickson thought, well, how can I create states of consciousness or responses where the client is in the frame of mind where they want to show me those behaviors. He didn't apply it to seduction. My insight was to go, wow, this guy is a super fucking genius. 
I'm going to take his insights and map it over to seduction. Now, it doesn't always map over, but you'd be surprised how often it does. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Now, let me be honest. Often, it, it doesn't work all the time. Sometimes it doesn't work because yeah, I'm nothing, not. Nothing works all the time. The best system no, will work all no, the time. No such no. Thing. Run with your wallet if someone says that. But it's better than dating, and it's better than directly complimenting her. It's better than talking about what she do, what does she do for a living. And even then, there are ways of digging into that. There's what I call the curiosity code, the conversation code. Can I give you another example? Yeah, of course, man. So I was having a conversation with a woman who was um, a healer. And I asked the interesting question. I didn't say, what do you like about being a healer? How did you get started? Why? Because that's an average frustrated chump's question. You have to, you don't have a lot of time. When a woman is hot, you don't have a lot of time to make impact and to make an impression. You don't. Because she doesn't have a lot of attention span. She's got a lot of options. Why should she pay attention to you? So I didn't ask her, how did she get into being a healer? Or what, why did she do it? I said, what was your first moment of discovering, of uncovering that healing was your journey, what you're meant to do? And your pupils widened. And she said, I remember it very clearly. I was walking with my mother, her ankle twisted, and something just came inside me. She used these words. Something came inside me. I felt this flow of energy through my body. And I heard a voice say, you're going to heal your mother. And I just looked at her. I watched the bone reset itself. Now, whether her story is true or not, I don't know. It doesn't matter. In her world, it's true. I said, wow, isn't that amazing? When something powerful comes inside you and you feel that flow of feeling in your body that lets you know something big and miraculous is about to take place. And I very subtly, I didn't call it in like an airstrike. I very subtly slid my hand down and pointed to my my Johnson rod. Do you understand? And then no, we got. No, I definitely understand. You're using strong innuendo. So let me ask you this question: Are you when you're saying this? Are you saying it with like a little playful smirk on your face? Or are you like no. serious? No, no. There's no smirking, and I'm never serious. It's just I'm saying it with with genuine curiosity, because if you ask the right questions, a woman will give you everything you need to seduce her. So this is very interesting conversation. It went further. I said, this is really fascinating to me. So tell me more about this flow of feeling in your body. And she began to describe it. And I said, wow. Um, so I just got her into her body and describing the flow of feelings, et cetera, et cetera. I added in some sexual innuendo. Now, this all took place in a Zoom conversation. She lives all the way out in Indiana or something. And I wasn't particularly attracted to her. And we're in a business mastermind together. So not, I'm always practicing. It doesn't matter to me. If a woman is a war pig or a 10, I'm going to practice. Because oh, practice, awesome. practice, I'm always practicing. Mm -hmm. So let, let me ask you this question. So um, let's say you're on a date with a girl, right? Like, Or let's say whatever one of your clients is. So how would this, like, give me like an overview of how this would yeah. work throughout the span of like a two-hour sure. date. Okay, let's be careful. I don't like the idea of the date. The whole, let me tell you, I, I, I'm respectful to you. I don't mean to step on you. I, I, and no, I'm very good, grateful. Man. I'm no, very good. grateful for you letting me no, address you. Having you on, man. You're good, man. I won't take any offense to anything you say. No, but I want your tribe to understand that I'm showing you respect. Much I, appreciated. I, this is meant to be respectful. Look at your language. The whole idea of a date. Where do we even get the idea that you have to go out on a date? It's not in nature. Did, uh, did early man go out on dates? Yeah, I this guess is, just because uh, it's like socially accepted, I guess. But it's yeah, socially point. programmed into our brain yeah. that we have to ask a woman out. Uh -huh. We have to decide where am I going to take her. Uh -huh. And the idea that you have to spend money, even if it's on a drink. Uh -huh. When you go out on a date, you're hoping, you're gambling, you're sort of rolling the dice thinking, I hope the atmosphere, I hope my confidence, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, maybe I'll get lucky. I say to my students, look, if you were, I'll say to you, Alex, if you were going to get on an airplane uh -huh. from London to Los Angeles and you looked in the cockpit and you said to the pilot, how are we going to make sure we get to Los Angeles? And he honestly, with no joke, said, I don't know, maybe we'll get lucky. What would you do? <laughs> get the fuck off that plane. Get the fuck off the plane. But we have language. The whole dating frame language 
maybe I'll get lucky. When do I make my move? Oh. When do I make my move assumes that you only sexualize at the end of a certain sequence of events. Yeah. Instead of the concept, wait a minute, maybe I can sexualize and centralize from the very beginning of the first conversation all the way through. So there is no such thing as making my move. So speed seduction. Yeah, that also I very much agree with. So I, yeah, I also I'm a big proponent of like sexualizing all the way through. So, um, yeah, yeah. I, I think we definitely agree on a lot of stuff, even though we come from completely different generations. But so how would you? And I think you make a fair point about like you know how be being careful of how you talk to yourself. So how would you like? Uh, what would be the terminology you would use then for like a date? I would say um, I would say a meetup. Okay. Uh, um, Grab a drink or something. I, I um, go for a walk in a park. Meet at the beach doesn't matter as long as it's a quiet place where she can hear my voice and I can hear hers. Oh. Give me half an hour to 40 minutes. Now, if you want to enjoy a nice quiet meal, that's fine. I don't mind, but I don't want you to depend on the food and the atmosphere to get you late. No, I, it's, I, I, your I, I, energy, it's your energy, your vibe, your beliefs about yourself and how you communicate. That's going to do it. And here's the other thing, guys who are naturals with women, one of the things they are or is they're non-conflicted when it comes to their sexuality. They don't have a part of them that's saying, be ashamed of it, hold back, and another part that's saying, no, go forward, go for it. They're complete, there's not that conflict. They're completely non-conflicted. Oh. So I say be interested in the girl, but be invested in your skills. Every champion in any sport, they want to win the game, but they're invested in building their skills. So you have to have the right mindset too. But to answer your question, what I would do is set it up before on that first conversation that she's already into me and she's already thinking about me and at best fantasizing me. So by that quote, day two, and who says there even has to be a day two if you get her sufficiently turned on. Uh, yeah, sure, for sure. But let, let, let me. Uh, this is just for the sake of like better understanding the system. And I, I agree with your points. I also always try to get girls to come straight over. Uh, let's okay. Let's let's do this hypothetical. Let's say that you know I set up a blind date for you with some attractive girl. All you know about her is that she's hot. That's all you know about her, and she's meeting you at a bar nearby. So what I'm going to talk to her on the phone first. The first thing I'm going to do is talk to her on the phone. I'm not going. I, I want to talk to her on the phone, so I can hear her voice. I can start the process of getting her programmed to respond in an excited way to my voice because my voice happens to be my weapon. Oh. And then if I met her, the first thing I would do is I would do something like my heart on sleeve pattern. Do you wear your heart on your sleeve? Uh, I have another pattern about laughter. I would make her laugh. And then I would I have a laughter pattern. Guys, this is going to sound crazy. It's going to sound a little odd because I'm going to lean on it when I normally I'm going to lean on it, you guys, so you can hear it. When I do it in a conversation, you can't pick it up consciously. So okay. is that fair to get that permission from everyone with that understanding that I'm leaning on it? Yeah. Okay. So I would make her laugh, not to be a party clown. I'm not trying to be her party clown and stay entertaining. Uh, I would make her laugh. And I would say, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine, by the way, Alex, this is a pattern I call quotes. When I want to say something that's really intense, I make it something that came out of someone else's mouth so I can step back from it. If she says, wow, that's kind of creepy, I can say, hey, I agree. I didn't I, say yeah, that. I, I, do, I do that all the time, too. Yeah, yeah it's called quotes. It's a classic NLP pattern. It's a way to take – so, yeah, if it's too far, you take the blame away from yourself. Like, you can't be blamed for something that someone else said. No, yeah, I said yeah, yeah, I agree with it. Did he actually expect that woman to – get really wet and think to yourself, i got to fuck this guy. Yeah. I can turn it around and still make it about suggestions. It's pretty funny because you and I have like different styles. We come from different generations, but we do a lot of the same shit. So I find a lot that of the same shit. I think that's because you're a natural. I, I don't know what your uh, the history. I don't know your history, but my sense is you either were a natural, have been a natural or you had naturals that you, you were able to learn from. The second one. So I was definitely not natural. I didn't lose my virginity until I was 19. I was pretty bad with girls for a good portion of my life. But one of my biggest influences was a uh, natural friend. And he is, I definitely learned a lot from various, you know, other guys, but uh, he was my biggest uh, role model. Yeah, he was a total natural. Yeah. So I would make her laugh and I'd say, you know, I was talking to, isn't laughter a wonderful thing? I was talking to a mentor of mine and he was saying that laughter is both a lubricant and a glue. 
It's a lubricant because it takes all that friction of two people who are meeting. And when you laugh, you start to lubricate away, Debbie, all of that friction. And you just slide into that place of comfort and connection. But he said it's also a glue because when people laugh, they come together and go even deeper into that place of connection. So I'm giving suggestions. Um, lubricate away, come together. Yeah, I'll definitely see what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. So now, guys, I want you to understand I'm not leaning on it. I'm doing it very subtly so they hear it. Mm -hmm. And you may think, come on, that's really far-fetched that she's going to interpret it in a sexual way. If I have the right rapport and I have the will to dominate, the will to dominate is really very important. I don't mean to harm, but dominance just means you're going to set the frame and you're going to control the frame. And yes, a little bit of a willingness to control her. Not a lot. You're not going to make her your slave, but you are going to enthrall her and get her to be totally focused in on you. So that would just be the start of it. Yeah. Um Okay, so let's let me unpack this a little bit more. So, what percentage of your like, let's say you're on a uh, we're not gonna call it a day. Let's say you're on a walk, right, or whatever. Uh, what percentage of your interaction will be like routines, and what 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 percentage of it will be just like natural free flow type of shit? I'm at the point I've been doing this 33 years, so I don't know how not. To, she can talk about anything. I can turn it into a language pattern. She can talk about she makes cardboard boxes in a factory. I'd say, wow. That must be so fucking boring. You must find your mind drifting off and going into a realm of fantasy and escape. I'm just curious. If someone gave you $10 million and you could go to some place that you've always been fantasizing about, what would you do? And if it's a place your friends never would ever, anything, and if you could go somewhere and your friends would never find out what you did, what's the first thing? You'd find yourself craving. You understand? So she could talk to me about the fact that she works in a cardboard box factory. I'll take it and turn it into a language pattern. So the answer to your question is, I'm always using this stuff. Even the kinds of questions I ask and the way I listen is a form of a seduction pattern. Yeah, I think you've gotten to a point where you've really internalized this stuff super well. So it's not even it's not even really a routine for you because it's just like so it's such a part of your way of communicating. But let's take Let's say, for example, you have a client, right? And he doesn't know anything about this stuff at all, right? So what, how, what would you, how would you advise him? Like what percentage of his interaction should be like the routine and what percentage of it should just be like in a natural like conversation? I would encourage them to ask questions that evoke the woman's imagination. Do not interrogate the woman. Don't right. ask her. Let's say she's, for example, uh, there's always going to be a little fluff conversation. I'm not going to make it one intense hypnotic yeah there has to be there has to be a, a state break essentially what that means is you can't have her keep going into all these excited states she'll her head will explode or she'll run away what you need well, also to the, the concern is that if you are uh you know someone who's not really I don't know, hasn't really internalized this stuff of coming off as like gamey, you know, coming off as like, like, you know, like, oh, this guy's like trying to do his shtick. So I get you would be surprised. Uh -huh. I understand that concern. You would be surprised at how women eat this stuff up, uh -huh. uh, even when it's delivered in a way that feels robotic, because it's, it's just that powerful. But I would encourage guys to just use little pieces of it. Uh -huh. Learn it first. I teach guys. Don't do whole language patterns. Just take little pieces of suggestion, like feel fascinated. Enjoy this connection. Feel a new direction for your thinking. Just sprinkle that in to what you would otherwise reverse. Yeah, mm -hmm. Just start with little tiny tidbits that you feed that baby bird. Uh -huh. Just start that way. And then you can build up to a full language pattern. But I also like this idea of being curious in a way where you could drop in suggestions. I don't care what she does for a living. There's something that she either enjoys in that or she hates what she does. So I can move the conversation into, well, if you could do anything, if there were no limitations and nothing you did would ever get back to your friends or your family, what would you love to do then? Yeah, you that, know, that's so true. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, you go ahead. 
I was just gonna say that's so true because uh, you said like uh, you know be curious, like find that curiosity. And I just I was thinking about it. like that's a you know when I go on a quote unquote date or walk or whatever, that's like you know I I try to find something about what something about her that I can be curious about. Like and again, even if she has the most boring job, let's say she let's say she's a hot girl who's an accountant. And like I can find that to be curious. I'm like, how how are your clients focusing on you when you got like your big titties hanging out? And I probably won't say that exactly. But, like, <laughs> there's something there's something I can find to be curious about. Exactly. Right. Find that genuine curiosity. Exactly. That will take you pretty far. Well, it's much better to talk about yourself. You know, I, I agree with what you said earlier. Let's like, let's break that down. Down. So let's Alex. Let's unpack that. Uh -huh. I teach. You can get curious about the four C's. Where she finds her sense of connection. What does she do in her life where she feels connected to something bigger than who she is? What is she craving? What's missing in her life? Something she desires and wants, but for some reason she just can't get. That doesn't necessarily have to be sexual. She could talk about it, but I'll turn it into something sexual. So I'm opening up that part of her mind because I know I can steer it towards something sexual through innuendo or I can do it. So what she, how she finds her sense of connection, what she's craving, what is she creating? What is she constructing? What is she working on in her life in the present moment? What's a goal that she's working towards? You understand? And then her sense of contribution. How does she get her sense that she's contributing to the world? Now, women may not always, it may not be a hit on all of those. You have to keep going. There may be women who only want to talk, who have lots of cravings, but they don't want to talk about it. Uh -huh. There may be women who are creative and they want to talk about that. So uh -huh. you know how, you have to know how to handle that. Uh -huh. I like artists. I don't mean actresses. I like like creative people who can paint. And I will never say to them, how do you get into it? Instead, I'll say, I'm fascinated by this talent you have. How do you know when it's time to paint? What is the signal on the inside that lets you know? It's time to create something beautiful. And I'll gesture between she and I. It's not like, it's a very subtle gesture. So the unconscious mind applies that, creates something beautiful to the two of us. That's forcing her to dive down deep into her process, her unconscious mind, and evoke unconscious processes. Because the creative process isn't really consciously thought out. It comes in a flash of intuition, usually from the unconscious mind. Does that make so sense? Yeah. So let me ask you this. We, we've, we've heavily covered uh, verbal escalation. Where does physical escalation fit, uh, right. fit in? This? Right. Are you like right. touching your knee or like how, how does that work for you? Uh, so I say there is friendly touch. So like every time a woman laughs, I'll just pat her on the shoulder or touch her hand. There's friendly touch. There's um, evocative touch. Where I'm, I have this great pattern called airplane finger fun. I can't go into it here, but I talk about an experience I had on an airplane. It's a true story where we just finger fucked the whole, we got a blanket and all we did was fuck with our fingers. We never touched our genitals. We never kissed. We just made love with our fingers for like a two hour flight. It was one of the most erotic experiences of my life. I'm not making this up. So once I get her sufficiently comfortable, I can go into that story. And that's an incredible turn on for them. And then there's sensual touch. There's a point. So there's the back of the neck. I, I, I can't, you can't clearly see the back of my neck, but if you rub your palm on the back of the neck, it is incredibly sensual. There are YouTube videos of me demonstrating this. It's not with your fingers, it's with your palm. Okay. And you usually hear like, oh. And when I hear that, I say, I got to go to the restroom. I'll be right back. And I'll touch her again. Um, when I, when I, when I, um, when I get up to go. So, and then there's also different spots. There's the thumb, the palm of the hand. That's what I'm talking about. That will get her turned on before you start, before you start making out. Does that make sense? No, it makes sense. The way I always explain to guys is there's three types of escalation. There's the verbal escalation, which we you know, we covered pretty well. There's the physical escalation. And I think the mistake a lot of guys make is they think physical escalation is making out. But physical escalation starts with your proximity with, you know, touching her knees. So physical escalation starts right. way before the make out. And then there's uh, uh, what you call like locational escalation. So that's like getting her back to your place. And then when you're at your place, getting her to your bedroom, just by like, if you're in the living room, just by the fact that you got her in your bedroom, you've already escalated. Like there's already a lot more sexual Correct. tension, even if everything else Correct. is 
So I generally try to focus on all those three types of escalation. I think the mistake you guys make is they only focus on the physical escalation. And, I, and they you know, think it only has to happen at the end of a yeah, thing called yeah. a day. They're yeah, thinking, I do this, I do this, and then I escalate. The other thing is, good point you made. In Japan, in Japanese culture, it's very crowded on the subways. People mm -hmm. cannot avoid touching each other's bodies. Mm -hmm. It's just the way it is. But the cultural norm says you have to stiffen your muscles. If you're <laughs> pressed up against a woman's body, body to body, mm -hmm. You're not groping her as long as your muscles are stiff. But if you relax into her, that's considered groping. It's like <laughs> grabbing her tits. You can get arrested for it. So I do what I call the relaxed lean. It's I always want the woman sitting side by side or diagonally to me. I never want her across the table from me. I agree. Also, yeah. same, same with me. 100%. Right. What I'll do is I'll lean into her. Just for, I'll test. If I lean into her and she leans back against me, then I know I'm getting somewhere. Or if she's soft when I lean against her, I'm getting sore. But if she stiffens her muscles, then I know I have more work to do. Right, right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, one thing I'll do is like, I'll find a reason to touch her hand and see how long, does she grab my hand back? That's a very good sign. Does she move her hand away? Okay, yeah, there's more. Right, done. right. Yeah, so you have to, and this is the problem with a lot of guys. They're not calibrated. There's yeah. so much in their head. There's so much internal dialogue. There's only so much real estate in consciousness. And so if a lot of your internal dialogue is taking up your consciousness, how can you calibrate to that woman? So that's why in speech seduction, we teach some meditation techniques and some other techniques to quiet the mind. So many guys, one of their biggest problems is they don't know how to shut up inside their own head. It's true. I'll say it again. You need to learn to shut up inside of your own head. Yeah. And also control your sexual energy. If you're spurting from your dick, I don't mean literally, but if the sexual energy is so intense that you're popping a boner and you're shaking inside. My last girlfriend, 20 years old, smoking hot, literally, we would get stopped by women on the street who would tell her how beautiful she is. She's about to have a baby, not mine. <laughs> anyway, uh, she told me, she said, you know, I used to go out on dates with guys and they would start shaking and it just freaked me out. Why were they shaking? I said, honey, they're sexually turned on and they don't know what to do with it. So guys have to learn how to ground their sexual energy. And there's some exercises you can do, physical exercises, and also shut up inside your own mind. You can learn to quiet your internal dialogue. Can you give an example of one of these exercises that a guy can do? Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think a lot of interventions can't be done in here. They have to be done with the body. It's, I don't want to stand up and show you my fat, my big body, my big muscles. But um, one thing you guys, I teach guys to do is if they're feeling overcharged sexually and they're standing up, it's just very slightly bend their knees. Not like you're going to bow down and pray, but slightly bend the knees, exhale, and then as you straighten up, inhale. It grounds the sexual energy and, and puts you back in your body. If you're really nervous, if you're super nervous and are having approach anxiety, go find some place, step into the bathroom, do a forward bend. You don't have to touch your toes. Do a forward bend, inhale for like four, exhale for five or six. That turns on the parasympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for getting you out of fight or flight. Use your body to ground yourself and calm yourself down. Yeah, a lot, a lot of the stuff you're saying is very is very popular in the yoga community, actually, because I used to take a lot of yoga. So a lot of the stuff you're saying, I heard. Uh, well, that's a four thousand. That's a four thousand year old practice. Oh yeah, for sure. I'll never knock yoga. I was a big proponent of it. I still am to some degree. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me ask you this question. Uh, out of curiosity, how did you meet the twenty year old chick? Was it just from cold approach or friends? Believe it or not, I met her on Tinder. <laughs> Really? Okay. That, I yeah. was not expecting that answer, to be honest. Well, with you. but you know what? She was looking for a sugar daddy. I converted her out of that. I did oh. some patterns Ooh. on her, and that got rid of the whole sugar daddy thing. Oh, yeah. Can, I, can, you, can you expand on that? Because that's pretty fascinating. How did you uh, convert one? Well, um, I talked. She wanted a sugar daddy. I said, really? So if you had lots of money, you could go anywhere you wanted. Tell me where you'd go. And she said, I'd go to the Bahamas. I said, really? Take me with you. So we're in the Bahamas. What's the first thing we enjoy the most? And she said, I'm looking out at the beach. I said, describe the feeling of the sand on your feet. 
And she told me, I said, take me by the hand. I took her hand. I said, let's go into the water. Tell me how the water feels. Is it warm? She said, it's super warm. I said, where do you feel it's swirling? It feels absolutely the best. And she, she blushed. And then I said, doesn't matter whether you focus in on where those feelings go first or whether you focus in on where they go next or whether you focus in on where they feel absolutely the best. What my friend says, what matters is you think to yourself, there's an opportunity right here. And if you don't take it, you'll lose out forever. Anyway, keep taking me into the, what else do we do? And we went on, but I had already implanted the sexual stuff in there. And this was, this was on the date. This was not over text, right? No, I don't do stuff over text. The problem, I don't knock, you're the expert on text. I, I uh, My experience is that I can't do my language patterns over text because they have to be heard. Yeah, of course. Yeah. The language patterns I've designed don't work over text because they're not, they're designed to be spoken and to be heard. I get, let me be very clear. I'm being incredibly respectful. What you do works. I'm not knocking what you do. I'm simply oh, saying, that. Well, no, what I'm doing won't work through text. But yeah. absolutely, what uh, I'm absolutely saying, my system is not designed to replace what, anything that works. It's just designed to enhance it, to make it more effective once you get them face to face. Yeah, no, that's, that totally makes sense. I guess, I guess my question was, because um, you know, I, uh, like you match with her on Tinder, right? So, what? How did you get her out to meet up in the first place? Like, what, what's your strategy? It was, it was, uh, it was a couple of years ago. I don't really remember. She was eighteen at the time. <laughs> but was it? Would you say like you? Because you mentioned you like phone calls. So did you get her on the phone? I got call? her on the phone. Okay. I got her on the phone as soon as I could. Okay. I, I just look. My vo you hear my voice. I have a I have a great voice. My voice is my weapon initially. Mm -hmm. That's my weapon. I can't, I, I, I'm not good looking. I believe in your system, but this would be a lot of work for you to do to make me uh, photogenic and to make me attractive. And at 62, it's gonna be harder to get women who are like 28, 29, 30. I'm not saying it's impossible, but that's not, and on Tinder, my understanding, and you're the expert on these dating apps, women are the currency. Women are what, what makes them run. And they have so – I talked to one woman, my doctor actually, my naturopathic doctor who's 31 and super hot. She went through all her matches on Hinge. She's just going through them. There are like hundreds of them. And she says, I've, I've given up because I can't keep track of all the conversations. It's impossible right. to make it work. Yeah, no, that's very, that's very common. Girls get overwhelmed. I mean uh... – my, the lady who works on my front desk, she's uh, on the hefty side, to say the least. She's like you know, 250 pounds. Oh, uh, Jesus. She got, what was it? She got 5,000 likes in like a month or something. It's, it's insane, dude. Like versus me with like, you know, professional photos or whatever. I can't even come close to that. So, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, I guess because so with the with the 20 year old. So you're saying that initially she just matched with you because she thought you'd be her sugar daddy. And then basically. Mm -hmm through your game, you converted her into just being a regular girl. Yeah, I can, now she was. She still went out and looked for other sugar daddies, but she didn't fuck them. They just spent money on her. To, she would charge money just to sit there and yeah, have yeah. them have dinner yeah. with her. I mean, what fucking suckers guys are. They're There's paying for expensive yeah. dinner, and she's charging them like 250 300 mm -hmm. bucks for an hour. Just, no sex, no touching, just to talk. No, I'm very familiar with that, yeah. I mean, it's amazing. Like Think of the power that a young, beautiful woman has. I'm not exaggerating. She would literally be stopped. We would be walking down the street and women would stop her and tell her how beautiful she is. And I'm thinking, what the fuck about me? What am I, chopped liver? <laughs> yeah, dude, it's crazy. It's crazy. The only thing that beats hotness is fame, like a star fame. But aside from that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that kind of status, that kind of status. But again, we can't all be Brad Pitt's. We can't all have the status. That's the reality. And here's the thing. We can't all have a big social circle. Yeah, my yeah. students are forty. A lot of my students, not all of them, but they tend to be at least, you know, in their thirties. They're working sixty-hour weeks. Many of them, they built their own business or or legal practice, whoever. How are they going to build a social circle? They don't have time. No, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a fair point. I've never actually been a big advocate of like doing the social circle game stuff. If it happens, great, but I've never like focused on that. So let me ask you this question. So we've talked a lot about uh, external game. You mentioned earlier that half of it is. Also, how you talk to yourself. So, can you explain yeah. on that? What, uh, how do you, well, you know, I think first and foremost, 
first and foremost, it's about removing what I, I, I don't like to sound airy fairy. I try to be fairly rigorous and even rigid, not rigid, but rigorous in my talk. But I believe there's spiritual fear is one thing and anxiety is one thing. They're relatively, listen to my words now, relatively easy to deal with. But I think underneath that, there's shame and there's envy and there's resentment. Many guys who have not done well with women have a tremendous amount of shame. They're ashamed of it. There's envy. They envy men who are successful and they resent women. They resent the fact that women have all the sexual power. And so we need to learn to teach men how to release these, I'm going to use the word spiritual poisons. And that's a matter of meditation. I teach a meditation practice oh, and, then, wow. and then a practice of, of what I call surrender and embrace. So, for example, it would go something like, I surrender my right to be resentful and full of envy and embrace my practice of blessing the success and the gifts of other people. I'm, so it's about surrendering your right to be envious, not surrender envy. I said, I surrender my right to. What's the difference? It's a subtle difference. When I say I surrender my right to, it acknowledges, that, yeah, I can do it if I want to, but I'm choosing not to, which gives you power over it. It puts you at effect rather than cause. So there's a series of affirmations. There's uh, some rituals that we do, and then there's meditating. And then there's subconscious reprogramming. I, I, I actually have something called unstoppable confidence where you listen to it and you do a series of visualizations and affirmations and that sort of thing. Don't get me wrong. It takes time. If you've been filled with envy and shame and resentment, it usually takes about 90 days to clear it all, clear it all out. But you start seeing results in a matter of weeks. I would say 90 days is actually really fucking good. Um, that, that, that's really good because usually you know it takes longer than that. Have you ever read the book Psycho Cybernetics? Of course, I love that book. I hate Think and Grow Rich. That's a load of bullshit and lies. Yeah, but so I, a lot of the stuff you're describing is like very in line with that book. Yes, I love Maxwell Maltz. He almost discovered NLP. He was decades ahead of his time. I'm very happy that you read that book. I love that book. Thank By the way, you. just out of curiosity, are there people watching this live? Yeah, we got 120 people live right now. Oh wow! Are they gonna are they gonna ask questions at some oh, point? Oh, we, we got a whole crap load of questions, but I want to get through my questions first, and then we'll oh, get to the questions. I yeah. love this. I can go for another hour if you want. I mean, awesome, I love yeah. I love I love teaching. I'm an old fuck now. <laughs> I'd rather to me, I'd rather teach than fuck because one takes more work than the other. I can always do one. Sometimes the other, not not so frequently. <laughs> But yeah, so we were talking about uh, you like reprogramming your subconscious, basically. So yeah. I I definitely understand how NLP comes into it, and I've talked about this publicly. I've actually personally done NLP. Like I've had you know I've I've had it done on me. I've done hypnotherapy many times. I find it very interesting. Uh, how so? But how does meditation help you clear your subconscious bad beliefs? Sure. So when we meditate, I'm talking about a certain kind of meditation. Yeah. So there's mantra japa which means repeating a mantra, om, om, om. I don't teach that. I'm not putting it down. I'm past the stage of knocking anyone's work. That was 15 years ago. That's the old rock. <laughs> what I do is vipassana. It's insight meditation. It's an old Buddhist practice like from 2500 BC. But the way it works is you simply pay attention to whatever is arising. First, you pay attention to the breath or you may pay attention to sound, you may pay attention to a feeling of the shirt on your back. Sooner or later, you come to paying attention to the emotion in your body. And the whole point is to pay attention without judgment and without trying to change anything. So if, for example, you're feeling a wave of shame, you don't try to change it and you don't judge it, and you don't try to stop it, you let it flow and you just track the flow. So for example, I would say face, gut, chest i would just let it flow and and label it and you notice over time even the most difficult emotions over time if you pay attention to them lovingly without indulging in the story without telling yourself a story about them mm -hmm. well i feel this way because or my mom beat leave the story out and don't try to change it you understand 
If you do that over time, the emotions lose their grip. A big change happens for people when they're no longer looking through their beliefs, but they're looking at them. This is what I call witness consciousness. So again, this is only my map. It's not true with a capital T. It's incomplete. It's subject to error. It's subject to improvement. My map is we have witness consciousness, which is what we need to really heal. We have creative consciousness where we tap into our the source of our imagination, our creativity, our intuition, our higher self, if you believe in that. Then there's willpower. There's will consciousness. Nothing's going to stop me. I'm going to get to my goal. I'm going to push through pain, et cetera, et cetera. And so I believe to really get good at anything in life, we need to find a balance between these. So Vipassana allows us to develop that witness consciousness. May I give an example of how this yeah, works? Of course. When my mother died, uh, I, to this day, I'm in love with my parents. They were the best people and the greatest teachers. My mom was my greatest teacher. My father was a war, war hero. He fought the Nazis in World War II. Oh, wow. he, was, he was in the real shit. He was a combat medic. He couldn't carry a gun. He was wounded by the Nazis in the Battle of the Bulge with shrapnel. Mm. So when my mother died, it was the first death I'd ever experienced. And I was in so much emotional pain, I couldn't think straight. I was stupid. I couldn't put senses together. And the, it hurt so bad, I couldn't sit in meditation. I had to lay down. And I just let the pain flow through my body. I noticed where it ended. So, for example, I felt a tremendous gripping in my chest, and I went to the border of it. I thought, where is the border of it where the feeling ceases to be? And I just, for 30 minutes, I lay there, and I swear to you, on the very memory of the mother who I'm talking about, after 30 minutes, it just broke up into waves of energy. And for a second, I felt a wave of peace and a wave of bliss. And I was still mourning. I was still grieving, but I wasn't crippled. I was able to function. Uh -huh. I was in pain, but I was not suffering. Uh -huh. And so it's very interesting. Through the practice of wanting to get laid, men begin to develop spiritually when they learn that everything is impermanent, no matter how seemingly pleasurable or how seemingly painful, that pain and suffering don't have to be the same thing and that pleasure and satisfaction are not the same thing you can have lots of pleasure but if you're not if you're gripping around it and won't let it go and you're really attached to it it doesn't equal satisfaction it's very my meditation teacher who taught me all this shinzen young thinks it's hilarious that i'm leading guys to meditation through getting laid he thinks it's very edgy you would think he'd be offended but shinzen thinks it's brilliant and so are you familiar with Brian uh, Bagan from The Fearless Man? Who? Uh, the Fearless Man. His name is Brian. Brian? He lives, yeah, he lives out of LA. He, his company's called The Fearless Man. I'm sorry, I don't. It sounds okay. like good. Yeah, I think you would really like him because a lot of the stuff you're describing, actually, in terms of the internal stuff, it, literally, he he also talks about all the same stuff. So I think you guys, I think you guys would have a lot in common. Can you uh, introduce me? Yeah, absolutely, definitely. Uh, not problem at all, but, uh, yeah, man, I mean, it's, it's all very interesting. I, I also think that meditation is definitely powerful. I definitely sh don't meditate as much as I should. Me neither. Uh, what I find, what I've personally noticed, I think you've got way further with meditation than I have because meditation, you know, you can go far with it. What I went as far as noticing that when I would meditate, I would be more calm when I was talking to girls. So just like my base, I don't know, I'd just be more articulate more calm. True. Like everything was just m moving slower. It's like, it slowed down the speed. Well, Absolutely. That's a great benefit. That's a yeah. great, one of the great benefits, a far more profound, benefit. I'm not knocking what you're saying, a, a far more profound benefit is seeing the end, the death of shame, the death of envy, the death of resentment. So instead of resenting people, you bless their success. Gratitude for what you have is important, but being happy for other people's success is the completion of gratitude. Now, this is not what you're expecting from a get laid, fuck women now, ask me how uh, guru. But no, it's man, I, think, I think it's all very interesting stuff. And I think that it's interesting because you can use this for more than just getting laid. You can use this for letting go of trauma and stuff like that. Business. Which, um, hey, I'm now teaching it for business. I have a book I wrote on using it for business. So words that sell. Um, yeah. So let, let me ask this question. So um, 
what, what do you do if you have a, like, let's say a tough case, like, let's say you have a guy who, for example, just had a lot of trauma and he's like, he has a lot of bad beliefs about women and whatnot, like an XRSD student or something like that. Right. How, what, what the same, like an XRSD student or something like that. Like, Oh God! Well, like, would would the same approach apply as well, or would you do something extra in that situation? I've gotten them. Well, first thing I tell people is, put aside. You need to junk everyone else's system. That's not said out of arrogance, but they don't mix. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother used to say, if you take one drop of shit and you put it in a pot of chocolate, you've ruined the chocolate. Right. I tell them you have to stop with all that dialogue, all the technical vocabulary. You need to junk it. Because that's not how things work. I, I agree with that. And then I will have a look at them and I'll sort of calibrate to what are their social skills in general? In other words, do they have problems with communicating with all humans or just with women? Uh -huh. A lot of them are, uh, sure, yeah. a lot of them, I would say about 15% of my students are asked somewhere on the autism or Asperger's uh, uh -huh. spectrum. And I will say to those students, I, I don't have the skill set to help you. I'm not saying you don't deserve to be helped. If you want to sit in on my seminars for free, you're welcome to come as my guest. I'll calibrate them. If they're really disturbed, I, I can't help them. If they have a personality disorder, bless their hearts, I can't help them. So if they're like narcissistic or borderline, I'm not blaming them. I have some narcissistic tendencies myself. We're all on that spectrum. But if they're really uh, on the edge there, I can't help them. Ross, just a quick question while since we're on this. Do you find that I've actually noticed that if you have some narcissistic tendencies, you'll be better with women. I've noticed yeah. this time and time again. Yeah. And some of the best guys I know are like actually narcissists. Well, when I say narcissistic tendencies, I care about other people. I right. have empathy for other people. Sure. I invest in other people's success. It, I, I am impact driven and um, very driven to have impact with other people and service minded. Right. And I can, I can be self aggrandizing. I can be very grandiose and call my, in this interview, I'm being, I'm sort of calibrated to you. You're a very stand up, straight level guy and, and I'm calibrating to you. I'm not being over the top. Yeah, I can get laid. I'm the best guy in the world. But I do take on that persona at, at some times, and that can be very grandiose and uh, arrogant and narcissistic. But I'm not, I, I know where I um, I know where I am on that spectrum. I'm self-aware enough to know it. Yeah. Well, let me, let me change gears a little bit and ask you this question. You know, you mentioned you're in your 60s. Where you're, I'm assuming you're single now? Yeah. Where do you, what's like your plan? Like, do you, do you plan on like just keeping doing this or what's, is your plan to like, no, you know, you know what? I'm ready to meet. I, I, and in, in my age, I take really good care of myself. I go to my naturopathic doctors. I intend to be healthy and functional into my seventies, maybe even eighties, but I'm ready to, to meet a woman who I can spend the rest of my days with. No, I, I don't ever want to get married and have a piece of paper. So that's going to take some look. Getting laid is relatively easy. Finding a really great woman of quality and caliber, it's not as easy. No, it's definitely not. It's definitely not. So I have a, I'm not going to get into my own personal list. Uh, for me, it's more about energetics. I've dreamt energetically about that woman. I know what she's going to feel like. What she looks like can be variable, but I know the energy. I know what the connection will feel like, and I have that pretty much down. But when I meet her, I'll hang up my guns. Do you generally have... prefer... Go ahead. Sorry. No, you ask. Do you generally prefer, like, are you looking for a younger woman or someone like, you know, your age? I'm not physically attracted to someone in my age. It's late 30s, early, uh -huh. er, late 30s, early 40s. I oh, dated a 47-year-old. My policy is don't date single moms. But I met her at a conference, and we were immediately all over each other. She looked like she was in her late 20s. She had four kids, but body was perfect. I, I don't want to be vulgar, but her pussy was tight as a teenager. Uh, she was hot. We only got along in bed. That was the problem. Yeah, there's some very, very hot older women out there for sure. There, well, we only got along, excuse me. I don't know why my nose is just, I assure you, I don't do anything. Um, we only got along in the bedroom. 
we didn't get along outside the bedroom. So, and plus she lived in LA and I, I'm in San Diego. I didn't like making the trip. Mm. Wait, did you freeze there for a second? No, I'm here. Oh, okay, cool. All right, gotcha. Let me, let me actually ask one more question before we take questions from the audience. I want to ask this. Uh, you've been coaching for a while. What are some of like the most- 30 common- years. It's a long time. That's yeah. pretty much the time I've been alive. What are yeah. some of the like the biggest mistakes or the most common mistakes you see guys making in the game? First and foremost, they're oriented towards behavior. They're thinking of what behaviors do I want that woman to give me? How do I get her to fuck me? How do I get her number? When do I go in for the kiss? Instead of thinking of states of consciousness, what mind frames? How can I create states of connection, fascination, desire, lust? I've got to get it right now. How do I activate her fantasy mechanisms in her mind, her craving mechanisms? They're thinking about behavior rather about rather than consciousness. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's uh, what's what's another big one that you see? They're too internally focused. They're in their internal dialogue and their mm-hmm. feelings rather than being outwardly focused. They're not emotionally calibrated to her. They don't calibrate to where that woman is at, not because they're broken, not because they're weirdos or anything like that. It's simply they're too much in their head talking mm-hmm. to themselves mm-hmm. and their sexual energy is either being tightened around, they're suppressing mm-hmm. it because they're ashamed of it, or it's flooding. A lot of guys do both. They either they flood, sometimes they flood, and sometimes they freeze. So it's very confusing to them. They don't know where they're at with their sexual energy. Yeah. A big one I see is uh, shame. Like there are shame and fear. That's very shame common. Is, shame is huge. And here's the other thing. We're not only internally shaming ourselves, but we have society that shames men. One of my coaches said, you should, you know, with your sales stuff, just come right out and say you were a seduction coach. Uh, she said, I have a woman, a uh, female client who talks about the fact that she teaches women how to be orgasmically attractive. I said, wait, wait, wait. It's okay for a woman to teach that. If a man comes out and says he teaches that, he's a, he's an exploiter, he's a pig, he's part of rape culture. You understand? We're shamed by popular Me Too culture. We're shamed by other men who say, what's the matter with you? You should know how to do that. You, you're getting ripped off. What's the matter with you going to a class? Are you a pussy? So not only do we carry our own internal shame, we're shamed externally. So yeah. the death of shame, the healing of shame is so important. Yeah. It, I would say that's like a huge thing I have going for me. I literally have like no shame. Like I'm shameless. I, I, I have shameless tenacity. I am not religious. I'm in, uh, well, my religious beliefs are what they are. I don't believe in, in traditional yeah. religion. But I have a friend who's a I have a friend who's a pastor, and his wife is a porn star. <laughs> How the fuck did that happen? He quoted something to me from Luke, where Jesus is talking about a guy who wanted bread because his kid was hungry. He goes to his friend's house, and he's banging at the door at midnight. And the friend says, go away. My wife's asleep. My kids are in bed. He's banging on the door. He says, I'm hungry. And Jesus says, I tell you, not out of friendship, but because of his shameless persistence, his friend will open up the door and give him all the bread he wants. So I think you have to have that shameless persistence to do well at this. Yeah, to do well in anything. Can I mention what I have for the guys? Or, yeah, or do you yeah, yeah, let's do it. So I have my uh, $7 Seduction Conqueror training. It's seven bucks. You get my Unstoppable Confidence training. You get... My awesome approach is blueprint that will teach you how to approach women anywhere, anytime, even if you're tongue tied, exactly what to say. And then I have the conversation code that will teach you how to embed these suggestions and topics that get a woman turned on. You don't even have to go out on a date. It's seven dollars with a one year money back guarantee. You go to it's a good good deal. If you guys are watching this on repeat, the links will be in the description. Yeah, it's seduce, seduce her now. Not seducer, but seducehernow.com. Sweet. Yeah, yeah. We'll put all yeah. that up. So um, for oh. seven bucks, for seven bucks, you know, if you're not if you're not willing to invest seven dollars in yourself, I don't know anyone who can help you. <laughs> Fair point. All right, let's take some uh let's take some questions. I love I respect, it. I respect lot Ross from J our mutual friend. Uh someone asked, Alex, you should ask his late count. 
Would you be open to answering that? Um, my lay count is under, believe it or not, it's under 100. I am really? not. Paranoid. Yes. Not I'm not, I am very paranoid about disease. Mm. My policy for the last five years has been pretty much has been we don't have sex until we're both tested. Because there's a lot of stuff out there. I have a student. He's no longer my student because he freaked out. The second girl he used speed seduction on gave him a nasty disease. He's got a big sore on his cock. Last time he called me furious. I said, dude, I warned you. Cover it or you wait two to three weeks and you both get tested. Yeah. I mean, my personal policy is I use protection until... Uh, you know. Yeah. At my age, I'm just going to be really frank. I'm going to be 63. I cannot stay hard in a condom. There's, I cannot yeah, yeah. wear a coat. I can't. I know. I know people my age who have that issue, so that's that's not like uncommon or anything. Well, uh, and so for me, the only choice is to ride bareback with tests. Right. It's a simple test. Big deal. It's a fucking. It does, you pee in a cup for for one kind, and then you, you know, have some blood yeah, drawn. Big fucking yeah. deal. And listen, if a woman will not, Mr. Kumar. Uh, oh, one of my uh, Daisy Boys. You will understand what that means. Um, one of my Daisy Boys, one of my brown men from the Indian subcontinent. If a woman will not get tested, she's hiding something. And there's something, somewhere around 40% or 50% of the population has one or more STDs. God forbid you get something that's incurable. Yeah. Well, there's there's really uh, two STDs that matter, in my opinion. There's HIV, which obviously you don't want to get because that's like a you know, even though it's not death sentence anymore, it's still like super severe. You don't want to have that. Plus, you have to disclose to every girl you sleep with. And if you tell any girl you have HIV, she's going to pass on you. So that's like a sexual death sentence and a permanent death sentence. The other one is HSV, which is for life. Uh, a lot of people do have that. What's HSV? You mean uh, human herpes? Herpes. Oh, herpes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other ones will be cute, pretty easy, but yeah, I do. Well, gonorrhea is no fun either because in order to test for gonorrhea, they have to dilate your, they have to stick a plastic thing inside your penis. Not anymore, I think, because I was tested for gonorrhea recently. It was just a straight up urine test. Oh wow! Well, good. They've improved the technology. <laughs> yeah. I will share this story. Actually, one of my buddies, he was just down in Mexico and he was, you know, having fun, fucking a bunch of girls, and he got, he started pissing blood, right? So you know, you would think like chlamydia, gonorrhea, whatever. He goes, he gets tested test negative, right? And the symptoms keep getting worse. So he comes back to America because he's like really fucked up. Does another test with an American doctor. They do all the testing, still negative, yet he has all the symptoms of an STD. So like what happened? Like we don't know, but probably got some like weird variation, like a Delta variant of like a fucking chlamydia or something like that. So he's like, you know, it completely destroys his life. So when I was younger, I used to be a lot more reckless. Like when I was in like my mid twenties, I used to like not really give a shit much, but like yeah, like, and for the last year or two, I've been, like, very careful with that. Like, I'll only, like, you know, I, I typically, I'll just typically use condoms until I, like, really know the girl or something like that. I can't anymore, so. Yeah. No, I know a lot of people who are like that. Like, one of my uh, really close buddies who lives in L.A., also, he just can't use, actually, two of my buddies, so. Now, yeah, here's I, the thing. I, I just want to address my Daisy boy. Daisy means uh, Indian or brown man. I just want to say that. Term, yeah. yeah, I just want to say to Mr. Kumar. What's really important to understand is that notching numbers ultimately is not satisfactory. It's the quality of the connection, the quality of the sex, and what you enjoy outside of the bedroom as well as inside. Great sex is still important, so don't go by numbers. Fair point. All right. Uh, which coaches does Ross respect and is friends with any of them? Who do I respect? I respect the guy by the name of um, uh, 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 Steve Maeda, M A Y E D A. I'm not familiar with him. Steve Maeda is out of Austin, Texas, and he has the Austin's men group, the Austin men's group, and he doesn't just deal with lays and sex. He deals with issues like addiction and divorce. And men's rights. He's a real stand-up man's man. I also respect um, a guy by the name of Stephen Grosh. He used to be one of Neil Strauss's coaches. He calls him. He goes by the. Uh, um, he also teaches self-defense. So his last name is spelled G R O S C H. Uh, 
I obviously respect what you're doing. I'm not terribly familiar with it, but obviously you've got a big, well, you've got a big tribe. So what you're doing must be working. I know I'm not going to mention, I tried something else and I won't mention it, but I saw a video of yours where you tore them to pieces. Um, I think you know who they are. They used to have, huh? Tom? No, he's some, uh, Oh, AMS. Uh, they used to call themselves perfect. Endless, uh, you know, oh, endless talking. options. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Uh, I found their system to be lacking. Yeah, it sucks. Well, they're mostly the, the problem is that the industry is largely dominated by internet marketers. That's the issue. That's the problem I found. I'm not, uh, I'm a great marketer. I'm not a particularly great systems person. And yeah, that, that guy's a great marketer, but I found his system to be pretty sucky. Yeah. Well, I think, I think the problem is like a lot of, internet marketers realize, hey, there's a lot of guys who are, you know, hurting. They really, you know, they're struggling with this. It's like there's, there's a strong need. So we can pander to them. We don't really need to, you know, learn game ourselves. We can just make a shitload of money out of these guys who are desperate. And so, you know, with all these ads and stuff. And it's hard. And, and they build a business model like a certain two companies I know of where they'll take anyone who takes their training who's willing to pay an additional $10,000, they'll turn them into a coach, even though that guy couldn't get laid in a woman's prison with a fistful of pardons. And now that guy's doing boot camps and leading. Again, I'm going to quote the Bible. I'm not religious. I'm an agnostic slash atheist. If uh, the blind lead the blind, they'll all fall yeah. into the pit. Yeah, no, it's a real problem, man. I mean, I think less than 10% of guys in the space are actually legit. Um, it's, it's a real issue and uh, it, it's sad because a lot of guys are getting ripped off. A lot of guys are getting scammed. A lot of guys, even worse, I think even worse than being ripped off is going downhill, right? Because you become resentful. You start to think that women are the problem and then you just develop these really bad mindsets, which are really hard to actually get out of. So I try to call it out when I see it. Uh, someone asked, can you guys talk about the 1992 show? So do, do you know what this is about? I think this is referring to a show I did. Uh, it's on YouTube where <laughs> this is real funny. Well, there are two possible shows they're talking about. One is the show. Oh, this is from Israel. Uh, shalom, shalom, manishma, efo kusiot. This is in Hebrew, and I'm Jewish, so I can read a little Hebrew. Uh, efo kusiot. That means where's the pussy? Uh, <laughs> so, wow, you have an audience all over the world. There's two shows they may be talking about. One show I did, it was me, a men's rights activist who was wearing a dress or a skirt, and then a mangina who's all about women's rights and oh. the audience i got the audience so mad at me i just was provoking it the audience was uh all women oh, it was the jane whitney show i think was that it uh yeah or faith daniels it was faith daniels that's the show and it was all female audience and i just got them so upset they were ready to kill me Here's the funny thing. When I walked out from this onto the stage, the producer just gave me a shit eating grin because she said, you didn't think it was an all female audience, did you? And I just thought, no, no, you got it wrong, honey. I'm not trapped in here with them. They're trapped in here with me. <laughs> yeah, so is, this, is this on YouTube? I want to check this out. Yeah. Um, just type in MRA PUA. Feminist. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'll take a look at that. Well, uh, you know, if I can find it, I'll throw the link in the description as well. Someone says Ross was the one who taught Neil Strauss game and thousands of others that learned from him. Yeah. You you personally taught Neil, right? Neil came to a couple of my seminars, but more importantly than that, he sort of shadowed me while I picked up waitresses at like California Pizza Kitchen. That's where oh, we right. usually met, where I gave him private lessons. What do you think about that guy? He's gone in kind of an interesting direction. He's also... I a, think Neil is a... Well, let me say the good stuff first. He's a brilliant writer. He was famous as a writer, as a, as the music writer for yeah. the New York Times before he ever got famous from the game. It wasn't nearly the same kind of fame, but he had written for Rolling Stone and, and for the New York Times, which is pretty prestigious but before this. Yeah. Uh, he's a brilliant writer. I think Neil gets off on betraying people, mm. right? Think about this. When he wrote the game, he knew full well that he was secretly writing about all the people he was pretending to be friends with. You understand? He, he was in a sense spying on everyone while pretending to be their friend. Right. 
And he didn't have to talk about Mystery's mental problems. He didn't have to do that. That was stabbing Eric. You don't talk about your friend's private stuff. If you want to expose your own shit, go ahead and do it. You don't do that to a friend to make money for yourself. That's fucked up. I know for a fact that he tried to seduce his coach's girlfriends. I know he slept with one of my favorite ex-girlfriends without telling me, breaking the guy code. Oh, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. So go. I know because the bro code. I know because she called me and said, you're going to be really upset. I wanted you to hear it from me first. I slept with Neil Strauss. I said, fuck, did he at least treat you well? Did he buy you breakfast? She said, no. Um, he wasn't really hungry. I said, did he put you in a cab? She said, no, he was in a hurry. So I took the bus. I was fucking furious. Not only because he broke the bro coat, but he he treated one of my best friends, who's still one of my best friends to this day, like a fucking two-bit whore. Oh, he geez. cheated on his fiance with her best friend. He's someone who gets off on betraying people. Oh, That's geez. he's not, he said he's a sex addict, maybe, but his real addiction, his real thrill, is betraying people and cheating. Oh, yeah, for some reason, I can just I just cannot imagine Neil's like getting laid. I don't know. He just doesn't have that like kind of charisma. He's yeah. very, uh, he's, he's quite effeminate. Yeah. 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 That's kind of what I noticed. And that's infamous, you know, the Jessica Alba interview on Jimmy Kimmel, like Neil's and J I was just like watching that. Very, that was a cringe fest. Yeah, I was like, well, I just, yeah, yeah, no, uh, just, I cannot see it. Uh, but you know, props for him for, you know, whatever he, you know, he did, he didn't introduce me to the game. So I do have to give him props for that because I found out about the game through that. Um, and I think he introduced a lot of guys to that, but yeah, I do agree with you. Like, yeah, he did not need to write about mysteries, mental breakdown. That was unrelated completely. Um, speaking of mysteries, and, and I'll tell you something else. I'll tell you something else. He attacked my students. He did called he? them greasy. Oh, my students are greasy and, and fools. He called them greasy fools. If you want to attack me, that's fine. I'm a public figure. I put my neck out in the chopping block. Yeah. I, I, but don't fucking kick my students. That's that's not fair. I don't hate mystery. I actually like Eric. Uh, Eric has been taken advantage of and ripped off, and people have made millions off of his original work. We had our disputes early on, but I actually like him. I think he's an original. I think, I think a lot of what's out there is either my stuff or his stuff or a combination of them mixed together. I don't think they mix. I actually think whether he knows it or not, he's doing some hypnosis. Uh, he doesn't know that that's what he's doing. But I don't hate him. I don't hate anybody anymore. I yeah, don't. I, have th I think this. I think this. The thing with mystery, I do agree with you. He's one of the uh, you know the OGs. Uh, definitely got to give credit where credit is due. I do think he has. Uh, he's stuck in time. I think he never like evolved. Like he's still talking about like doing Skype calls and stuff. And I'm just like, no one does Skype anymore. So I think he like he reached a certain pinnacle of success in like early 2000s and then he just stopped evolving i don't think that's the real, that may be true to me the real issue is in order to make his stuff work you have to take on a certain avatar yeah you have to be a certain demographic a certain avatar a certain psychographic whereas my stuff will work for anybody provided you're smart you can't be stupid and be speed and do speed seduction if you're stupid all you're going to do is memorize it and spout it out without understanding about it Someone asked, hope he talks about twin brothers pattern. Do you know what that is? Yes, I do. It's one of my most popular patterns. Guys have used it. This guy sounds like a fan of mine. I don't, I think I recognize his name. I don't want to go into it, but it's a language pattern designed to get a woman thinking about who is she most attracted to. A guy who's, they, they look identical. So they're twin brothers. They look just like the kind of guy where you look at this guy and you think, damn, I like a piece of him. Which do you find most? One of them's a great dancer. The other one has incredible hands. You can stop and imagine yourself indulging in these. Which one do you feel a growing attraction for? And it, it has them go through a sequence like that. Eric, stop hogging the limelight. <laughs> interesting. Uh, do you have any, uh, this is an interesting question. I have my own theories on this, but I'm curious to hear yours. What, what is your perspective on this? I don't think there's any such thing as natural game, direct game. There's only effective game. What works, what doesn't. Red pill, I have my opinions on red pill. Uh, some of what they say is accidentally true. <laughs> I don't like Rolo Tomasi. I think he's a big poser. He, yeah, uh, he, 
I we were actually scheduled to debate at uh, the 21 convention. He backed out. He backed out saying, I'm not a worthy opponent. Yeah, Rollo, Roll, I'll say Rollo is a pussy. I've uh, I've invited him to come on my channel so many times to debate. He he won't do it. He only he only talks to people who he agrees with. He doesn't want. He never debates anybody. He never. They have like their little circle jerk that they do. They never like try to. Uh, they're afraid that their opinions won't hold up under. Well, pressure. my yeah. my major problem with him is he speaks in the language of science. He uses He speaks in the language of science, but what he says doesn't hold up to scientific scrutiny. Yeah. I, on the other hand, don't claim to be doing science. I am saying you can't scientifically measure what I do. It's a map that will give you the results. It predicts that it will give you, but it's not science. I've never heard of choosing signals. What is choosing signals? Choosing signals basically means if you're like walking down the street and a girl's looking at you, right, that she's giving you a choosing signal that she, uh, you know, you, she wants you to talk to, whatever she wants to be talked to. It's something that AMS and like, it's, it's popular in the Red Bull community, but it goes, there's different like levels of it. So like, I personally believe, yeah, choosing signals are good, but there's some like, you know, teachers who will say that the only type of game you should do is choosing signals. So if a girl doesn't I get the degree, I think yeah. the way in which you approach creates the signal. So I, yeah, I agree with you. I don't think that you should, you know, wait for the choosing signal or you should, you should be free to approach anyone you find attractive. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's there's so many different styles, and I do agree with you about the uh, the problem of like people presenting their opinions as facts. You see that a lot in the Fresh and Fit podcast. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they like they'll just take things that they're experienced and be like, "Oh, that's a fact, man." It's not. You just pull that out of your ass. Uh, okay, this is an interesting one. I have a question. When men get to Ross's age, doesn't money matter to keep sleeping with young, attractive girls? Money is the greatest value an older man can provide. What, what are your thoughts on this? The greatest value you can provide to any woman is the intense emotions that she craves, that she longs to feel. I do not spend money on women. I don't do it. Once they're sleeping with me, and if I like them, I ha and we're already attracted to each other, we've established that intimate connection, I can be generous. I have no problem taking someone else to a nice, uh -huh. out to a nice dinner if we're already involved with each other. Uh -huh. I wouldn't use it as a mechanism to get us involved. So this is a limiting belief. If you're playing the dating game, God boss, if you're playing the dating game by traditional dating rules, you're right. You're absolutely right. But if you know how to get inside a woman's emotions, dive down into that fourth level of her mind, trigger her subconscious fantasy mechanisms, she'll crave that. Now, are there some women who are just devoted gold diggers and they're determined and you can't convert them? Yeah, that's true. Are there some women for whom money is the absolute number one value and you're not going to budge them? Yep. The question is, are you going to let that stop you from getting to the ones who are susceptible, who don't, who once you get them feeling those strong emotions, don't care so much about the money? No, I, th I agree with everything you said. I mean, me personally, I'm the same exact way. I have no problem being generous once I'm seeing a girl, but I'll never use money as like a way to get girls. I don't no. think that should. And it's all. insulting to them. You're buying them. Yeah. Although some women, don't, some women like, oh, I got shit for, uh, I was debating a whatever feminist. And I was saying that I personally don't think a man should be expected to pay on the first date. I said that I always pay on the first date, you know, just because that's what I do. But, like, I don't think it should be expected. And, like, they were, like, accusing me of not – whatever. It's a whole different thing. But They were accusing you of what? They were accusing me of, like, they're being like, oh, well, do you understand how hard it is to be a woman? We're at such a disadvantage, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, what does that have to do with me buying you a drink? Like, what the fuck does that mean? Excuse me. They control the pussy. What are you, what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Let's see what else we got. Uh I've used some of Ross's stuff on text and it worked. Okay. Uh, okay. What's the best technique to eliminate deep shame and insecurity? So first and foremost, I would say you have to work with the witness consciousness and creative consciousness, doing meditative work and then doing work where you practice radical forgiveness of yourself, where you surrender your right to shame. I like to say I surrender my right to shaming myself and I embrace my practice of unconditional love and unconditional self-acceptance. So what do you surrender and what do you embrace? Surrender and embrace, surrender and embrace. 
And understand insecurity and shame are not things. They're not like saying, it's like saying, how do I get rid of my kidneys? All right. Shame is not a thing that you have. It is a process that you're doing oh. energetically and spiritually. It's not a thing. There's no such thing as attraction or shame or insecurity. I'm using them as labels. They're activities and processes that you're doing or experiences that you're having. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, someone said thoughts on RSD. I don't want to get sued, but I don't like them. I don't like okay. their business model. I don't like anything they teach. I think they're full of shit. Yeah, I agree with that. I don't. Uh, I think they used to have some decent stuff back in the day, but not anymore. I think uh, and I also don't like their business model. Uh, yeah, I've said that before publicly many times. I think that yeah, they're ripping a lot of people off. You got to buy like five boot camps and all that shit. It's pure nonsense. And I don't. I, I really don't even think Tyler's qualified to be teaching. To hey, the honest. evolution of RST was Julian Blanc. That's interesting. Why do you say that? What's the natural progression of, of, of being socially wildly uncalibrated and narcissistic and having extreme contempt for women? That's interesting. I've always liked Julian the most out of the RSD guys. Uh, I've always found him to be like the most, I uh, don't know, the most humble, I guess. I don't know. Maybe it's because I used to be in the same yoga class as him. So I kind of. Yeah, like, but look what he did in Japan. He blew, he blew the whole thing. Yeah, I think I think what happened with him, my personal theory is that he was just like he kind of started experiencing God complex. You know, when you're getting a lot of validation, you start to shit in that, there. You can do no wrong. Yeah, yeah. It's tempting, dude. It's, in there. It's, yeah, yeah. A lot of people are giving you validation, telling you how awesome you're all day, every day, and then you just like keep pushing it, pushing it. Guilty, guilty, guilty is charged. Yeah. There's an interesting book that you might enjoy. It's called I don't know if you've already read it. It's called uh uh The Winner Effect by Ian Robertson. Have you heard of that? No, it sounds interesting. The winner yeah, effect. Yeah, yeah. The winner effect. It talks about how, like, you know, it uses Bill Clinton, how Bill Clinton, like, the reason he, the whole scandal is because he was going through that. He was just like, wow, he's achieved a lot of power. And he was just like seeing how far he can take it. And then that's, you know, where the Monica could was be. Going. Could be. Uh, this is an interesting question. Do you think action is the best form of inner work? I'm not sure I understand the question, but I think what he's saying is taking action uh, in the direction that you want to go will affect your inner game. I think that's what he's saying. The, no, the question is like, there's many ways to, you know, work on yourself and action is basically just going out and talking to girls and taking action versus like maybe sitting there. And here's, here, I think there's not, they're not contradictory. They're complementary. Do both. Yeah, I agree with that. The unconscious mind is impressed by action, but if you're taking action and it's filled with pain, you're just going to reinforce the cycle of pain connected to the action. Yeah. I think that's a good point. This is my mom. I'm amazed by what you're talking about. That's your mom? Yeah. It's, are you Russian, by the way? Yeah, we're Russian. Oh, um, Spasiba Ochen Ochen Horsho Drug. Did I get <laughs> that enough. right? Yeah, close enough. <laughs> I know uh, that, and I know the Russian word for shark. Akula. Akula. Yeah. And I know bear is medved. Medved. And I know that I am a stare prostutnik. <laughs> yeah, close enough. I'm 25 and have ADHD and social anxiety. In brief, what advice would you have for someone like myself? Okay, you don't have social anxiety. It's not like a bacteria in your body. It is an activity or a process that you're doing. It's something you're doing with your internal dialogue. It's something you're doing with the muscles in your body. But I would recommend something that's a somatic form of therapy called trauma release exercises. DM Jr., I have a assignment for you. Go on YouTube, type in Navy SEAL TRE, Thomas Richard Edward, Navy SEAL TRE, and you'll see these TRE techniques. They were designed for people who had undergone major trauma. You stress different muscle groups, you lay down, and the body literally shakes itself. It'll shake out all the anxiety and the trauma. The ADDHD, uh, that could be dietary related. Go to a naturopathic doctor. Do not go to an MD. They don't know shit about nutrition. I have a, two naturopaths that I go to. I went today and got a vitamin IV and glutathione because I wasn't feeling well. And we were discussing before the show, 
Alex, that um, you yeah, also I, I also do the vitamin IVs. Yeah, I would say also you can go to functional medicine doctor. They're pretty good or integrated medicine. But yeah, I do agree with you. Like a traditional MD, they're really bad with nutrition. Yeah, pretty much anything. Yeah, traditional medicine is great. If you break a bone or you need major surgery, you go to a fucking doctor. But for chronic conditions and stuff like that, uh, Western medicine, not my cup of tea. Yeah, I 100% agree with you on that. That's a whole different side tangent. How did Ross work on his voice? That's an interesting question. Uh, originally, my voice was like this. If you hear me uh, in my early stuff, it was more like up here. I worked on my voice through deep breathing, through breathing exercises. I opened up. See, try this. Stick your head out like this, everybody, and talk to here and try to okay. speak really deep with your head like this. Okay. Can't do it. But if you align your head, then you open up your chest. Oh. So probably your head is out of alignment. Interesting. Okay. Uh, different direction. Ross Jeffries, have you ever done psychedelics? Interesting question. When I was a much younger man, I tried mushrooms three times. I vomited every time, but I enjoyed the experience. I'm naturally pretty vigilant, even hyper vigilant. I'm always aware of my situation, who's around me, who could be a potential attacker, who could I fuck, who's here, who's there. It turned off my vigilance and my critical judgment of people and just allowed me to be completely open and free. I tried ecstasy once, didn't do anything for me, just kept me up all night. Tried LSD once and that was a horrible experience. I didn't hallucinate. I just felt tremendous pain in my muscles, like someone was hitting really? fiber. You think that was legit uh, LSD? Because it should not do that. Yeah, I think someone said you had. They cut it with strychnine, and so you were poisoned. Yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, because I've done LSD, and yeah, it, it's pretty crazy, but definitely nothing like that. Yeah. Um, okay, we kind of sort of answered this question, but I guess can you give us your opinion on Project Hollywood? Let's just uh, leave the question at that. Project Hollywood. They invited me to live there. I said I looked around. I said, I'm not going to be part of this frat house. No way. But I do remember the early days of sitting at Mel's diner with Neil mystery myself and Tyler, who was just a punk kid from Canada at the time, uh, sitting around and having meals at, uh, they rob, they ripped off, they destroyed project Hollywood. It's gone. They, they tore down the building. Oh, it's a shame. Could have been some kind of pickup memorabilia or something like that. Uh, okay, this question. Is it true that you, if you want to use NLP, you should learn hypnosis first? No. Okay. Ask him where we can ask, access his old private videos. Um, my secret stash they're talking about. It's my old, old stuff from like 1994. Um, if you will send me an email, ross at seduction.com, I'll have my people direct you to the link. Awesome. Thank you. He mentioned psycho cybernetics. Does he have any other book recommendations? Yes. Breakthrough difficult emotions. No, uh, breakthrough, break, breakthrough pain. It is by my teacher, Shinzen Young, S H I N Z E N Y O U N G. Uh -huh. anything, anything else off the top of your head? Um, let's see. Uh, well, they would be books on military history and science and on UFOs. I'm a big believer uh, in that stuff. Uh, so off the top of my head, no, not really. All right, gotcha. Yeah, some of the books I always recommend, Extreme Ownership um, by Jacko Willing, great book. Uh, another one is Total Recall by Arnold Schwarzenegger, another great book. Uh, the Winter Effect, really also good. And... Uh, um, uh, oh, I know a book I recommend. Uh -huh. I know a book I recommend. It's by my niece, Vanessa Van Edwards, who's an extremely successful author, speaker, and entrepreneur. It's called Captivate, How to Be the Most Interesting Person in the Room. Cool. I'll check it out. Let's take one last question, and I think it's a very interesting one. Uh, what differences have you noticed over several decades of the dating game as far as what works and what gets responded to? How has social media, tech, et cetera, changed the game? Very interesting question. I say the same thing works, which is capture and lead a woman's imagination and emotions, trigger her fantasy mechanisms, however you can do it across whatever platform you can do it. One thing I will say is that people's attention spans have massively shortened, Definitely. massively shortened. And because of apps like Tinder, et cetera, beautiful women have so many options to go through uh -huh. that they're certain they're just their market 
the market has become saturated. That's why approaching people in person has so much impact because no one does it anymore. That's very true, man. I mean, like, yeah, it's definitely changed the game because like, and also I think it's unfortunately negatively affected a woman's ego because the average girl who's, you know, pretty cute, she's getting bombarded with hundreds of guys telling her how gorgeous she is, how much they would love to fly her out, how pretty she is, how her shit doesn't stink. What's wrong with guys? What makes I, them think that this is going to work? I fucking know, man. It blows my mind as well. But, yeah, and so, like, this girl, unless she has a high level of self-awareness, like a girl who has a lot of self-awareness will be like, okay, I realize what's going on with the world. I, this doesn't mean I'm perfect. But the average girl, especially a young girl who doesn't have that, she's going to go into, you know, life with a big ego, and she's going to think she's this perfect flower who, you know, who like, who should deserves to get a multimillionaire because all these other, it, it's, it is crazy. You know what? Can I just say something? There yeah, are totally delusional entitled women who have hit the attraction while they're in their forties and they're 30 pounds overweight. And they think they're entitled to a genius multimillionaire uh, bodybuilder, not bodybuilder, but really attractive dude. And I always say to them, Hey, that guy is fucking the 20 year old daughter you never had. <laughs> Yeah. Are you familiar with Kevin Samuels? I'm sorry. No, I'm not. Okay. He does a lot of that. Like he, uh, he does, uh, like he talks to a lot of women, like older women and they're like, yeah, what kind of, what do you want in a guy? And she'll be like, oh, you know, I want six, seven figures and you know, you know, it's seven feet tall. And he'll be like, you're like a five, like you're not going to get that. So he does a lot of that. Pretty interesting. Do you have a cat? Is there an animal in the background there? I have a dog, but he's not in the background. I saw, I saw something moving back there. Must be the Miami wildlife. Okay, let me actually just quickly take this uh, because it's interesting. There's a guy named Derek Rake. I'm not familiar with him, but who pretty much took a lot of our stuff. What does he think about him? Do you know who this is? I've heard of him somewhere. I, I've heard he written. Look, so many people have stolen from me and ripped me off. All I can say is thanks a lot because they wind up coming to my to me for private coaching. Uh, I can't. I had an attorney who was a huge fan of mine. Not, uh, we split ways. We parted ways. But he said, we need to sue everybody. I said, you can't sue people. It's impossible. They'll just put it up on another website in Singapore. It's a, it's impossible. You just have to accept it. And I always used to say, I can create faster than they can steal, which is true. No, that's a fair point. I've had a bunch of people rip off my shit, too. I had one guy just verbatim copy it, like, you know, and I was like, should I sue this guy? How did they justify that? I don't know, man. I, I've never, you know, I'm not a thief, so I don't know how they think, but I, I really don't know. I'd have to like, it would be interesting to like interview one and see like how to, yeah, because I could never like myself like rip someone off. Like I just wouldn't feel good about that. No. Yeah. Um, and then you're always worried about getting caught in shit. So I don't know. But yeah, they, I guess they have their own like different thought process or whatever. Uh, I don't know. It's bizarre. Um, but all right. Yes. All right. Thank you so much for coming on. This was a really good interview and I enjoyed I you know, loved it. Love it. Anytime. I want to close by saying two things. First of all, let me let me give a plug because I am a businessman. If you want my Seduction Conqueror kit, that's the Unstoppable Confidence course where you just listen to it passively. We have uh, the awesome approach blueprint where it shows you three approaches you can use to meet women in person, anytime, anywhere. And then the conversation code teaches you what to say on the meetup. In the meetup, I don't like the word date to get laid. It's seven dollars, seven bucks. You spend more at Starbucks. Go to seduce her now, not seducer, but seduce her now.com. And it's a one year money back guarantee for seven bucks. Uh, I if one tenth of what I'm saying is true, it's all true, but if one tenth of what I'm saying is true, I think it's worth seven dollars. And the second thing I really want to say. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to address your community. You took a shot because you don't really know me and you, you rolled the dice on me. I hope I lived up to a standard of delivering a lot of quality with sufficient amount of humility to get my points across. So people, you, you definitely did no doubt. And it was a good interview. And I found it very interesting. Uh, we'll just ended off with this, that even though you and I come from different generations and different schools of thought, uh, we, we pretty much do a lot of the same things. Like I just maybe worded differently, but as you were talking, I just kept thinking like, Oh, I do that. I do that. Like the compliment thing, for example, I was like, yeah, I always, I also do like the kind of like the indirect compliments all the time, but I never do like the direct stuff. And like, so a lot of the stuff as you were talking, I was just thinking about how I do a lot of that too. So I found that very interesting. Uh, even though we like, you know, we've never talked before this and we, you know, no. we, 
we don't really follow each other's stuff, but just interesting how, like, I guess, like, we kind of more or less met the same place, but we went in different, you know, took different paths. So The truth know. points to itself, as one of my favorite aliens said on uh, my favorite all-time science fiction show, Babylon 5. I'm not familiar with that one. <laughs> but, uh, all right, Ross, thank you so much, and thank you guys for tuning in. We got – uh, we got next weekend, we got Courtney Ryan coming on. We got some more awesome videos dropping. So make sure you smash the subscribe button and check out Ross's work. He's got good stuff. We're going to put all the links in the description. Thank you, guys. Peace out.